Greetings, brothers and sisters. So I have big video to get to, lots of stuff to get to, uh, some RFK stuff uh, with the mainstream media finally uh, going after him, which is interesting. And then um, I want to get to that Fran Drescher thing, because that's hilarious. But I got a big introduction here talking about the capitalist system and something I don't think I talk about. I don't think I've ever talked about it this way, and I don't think anybody else has either. And it's one of the key components, the unrecognized aspects of the truth community. So let's start here with Jalen Brown, who I think is a good guy, as far as I know. I was told by some Celtics fan, or at least one Celtics fan, that um, he and Al Horford didn't get the boop. So, you know, that's cool. And, you know, he seems to give a lot back to his community, right? And now he's the highest paid basketball player based in how the contract structures work. He's probably a top 20 player, not the best player on his team, but he's, you know, a great player and he's gotten a $304 million contract, which is about $60 million a year in salary. And so he's, you know, being interviewed here by CBS News and he's talking about giving back to the community here want to help bridge the wealth gap here the wealth disparity is top five in the u.s every single so he wants to bridge the wealth gap which is a noble goal i have no problem with that you know rich people have too much money poor people don't have enough so that, you know that would be a positive thing in our society but it's impossible right the society is our system is not built like that it's the wealth gap is part of our system and it's pretty much for any one of these type of systems, it ends up being that way. So then she asks him, well, you give a lot of money back to the community, what are you gonna do for yourself? <laughs> I don't know, you know, I probably, I might get a new car. You might get a new car um, because, you know, of course he will. <laughs> so he seems to have a lot of good cars already. There's various pictures with him in his cars. It doesn't say, um, you know, uh, how many cars he has or what kind of cars he has, but he, here he is in Havana, Cuba, where they have all these retro cars because they, you know, they, they've had an import embargo or an export embargo from the U.S., so they have all these 1950s cars there. And this is his um, $7.8 million house in Wellesley. Uh, this is... Um, you know, Boston area, Wellesley is an exclusive area uh, around the famous Wellesley College that Hillary Clinton uh, attended, right? He's got a beautiful house, almost worth $8 million, right? So he is, you know, a wealthy person who's taking care of himself. I'm sure he's bought his mom a house as well or whatever it is, right? Um, so, you know, he's not living in poverty. He's not giving away all of it, right? <laughs> What's important about this? It's something that's not acknowledged by the truth community. It's not acknowledged by, um, you know, Trumpers and right-wing truthers. It's not acknowledged by the normal person. And it's the singular flaw in all this in terms of systemic flaw. And that is rich and famous people, rich or famous or rich and famous, by and large, really suck, right? That's... You know, the richer you are, the, the, the worse you are. Being selfish and being sucky and being rich and being famous go hand in hand because you inevitably feel better than other people. You feel like you're better because society says you're better and money is how you keep score. And fame is even, you know, a bigger score, right? You know, it's a, a different, even a different level. And when you're rich and famous, right, which usually happens if you're famous, you're usually rich. You can be infamous, and that's something different. If you're famous, you're put up on a pedestal, and you are achieving something, so you feel good about yourself. You had goals. You achieved those goals. But if you're born into wealth, like the royals and these you know, generational wealth and non-nouveau riche people, you think you're just better because you were born into that situation, that you have a, a different set of breeding and different type of person, right? And that goes across the board. It's been documented over and over again. You can see it everywhere. That these people who are born into wealth or people who 
uh, create their own wealth, people who create their own wealth can't understand why you can't do the same thing. If they did it, why can't you, right? And so they, you know, they immediately feel superior because, you know, they won the game, right? They are winners in the game of the, the capitalist system. People who are born into wealth are told their whole life they're better, and they're treated as such. They have servants. They have people waiting on them. They have people, you know, doting all over them. They have all kinds of people want to be them, right? And so they inevitably are going to feel superior. And so that's just part of it. Part of it is selfishness. Part of it is pettiness, whatever it is. Part of it is wealth and fame don't make you feel good, right? They don't make you happy. They don't make the success doesn't, isn't the goal of human life. It doesn't give you what your sole purpose is here for. And I've documented this with Madam Expiration Date and Will Smith and so many of these other older celebrities who were once at the pinnacle of fame and fortune and now are desperately <laughs> seeking something, right? Madam Expiration Date is, you know, desperate for her youth to regain what she once had, but she wasn't happy then. And that's the other thing. It's the law of diminishing returns, which is a financial principle, but it also works in terms of happiness, where, you know, you have something, let's say you eat something you really like, and it's great, like, I don't know, a custard cone, like a ice cream cone, a custard's even better, or something, you know, some sort of a dessert. And you have one, it makes you feel great. But then you have another one, and you're like, well, that didn't make me feel as good as this. the first one. So you eat a third one, trying to get back that first feeling, and now you're sick, right? And so that's how it works, like the, the law of diminishing returns. That your initial, you know, when you go from poverty to wealth, it's, it feels great. But then you don't feel as good because it's just material stuff. And it's burdensome. It's burdensome. The more things you have, the more things you have to worry about. The more properties, the more you know, whatever it is, more cars, the more everything. They need to be, they be, they need to be maintained. I mean, it's hard to keep your house clean now. And okay, you can hire people because you're wealthy, but that means more, you know, staff and more, you know, more output and more money you have to make to pay for your staff. Your financial nut grows, the pressure to keep your lifestyle going, a private jet, things like this. Well, you're not going to go back and fly a commercial jet now that you have a private jet. So you have to keep the money coming in. And when the money dries up and you can't afford all that stuff, you know, and the pressure to afford all of it is, isn't making you happy, right? And so there's very few rich people who are happy. If you meet rich people, you're around them. They're usually, in general, pretty miserable. And they're pretty petty. They're often envious and jealous. And, you know, and they're selfish and they're hoarding. And the, the more wealth they have, the more that they're hoarding and the more that they live in exclusive communities and are exclusive people, right? They're you know, they exclude other people. I mean, the first thing you do when you have money is you move away from other people, right? You get, you know, gated communities, big properties, big acreage outside of the city. You go to exclusive clubs. You go like whatever it is, athletic clubs or whatever, restaurants and, and places where you vacation where the poor people can't go, right? <laughs> like, so that's, I mean, you know, it's, it's a, an isolation type of situation, right? Where you want to be around people like you unhappy, miserable, wealthy people, right? I mean, there's some wealthy people who are just happy. There's some people who are just happy. There's some people who are just good people, no matter what they have, right? But in general, that isn't the case. Like wealth and fame doesn't make you a better person, especially since you spend all your time, like I said, maintaining your material life and so little time on your spiritual lessons and your family and the things that matter to you, that should matter to you. And so it becomes, uh, you know, uh, like you just become more and more lonely and desperate and, and unnatural and you forget why you're here and your soul's path and you get disconnected from everything that makes an, a normal, natural human being, a, a community, a, you know, all these things, right? Your uh, you know, connection to your soul is a challenge, right? In Saj Marg, there was a teaching, you know, as part of a you know, uh, it's, it didn't come from there, some other, you know, this is a, like a proverb. And Master Charge used to talk about this all, this all the time. He was somebody who was a wealthy person. He was, uh, you know, a person very successful in the business world and then became, you know, a spiritual master. And it's hard to do that, right? And there's a story of, uh, like, there's a, a bunch of people waiting in line 
at the gates of heaven. And, you know, St. Peter's getting everybody into heaven and a wealthy, famous person shows up and he's in like a, like a, you know, etheric limousine and he's rushed to the front of the line. And so there's some disgruntled guys in the back and they're talking about it, how like, you know, even here, these guys have privileges. And so they get up to the front of the line. They said, look, you know, we, uh, we suffered on earth and we work for these rich men and they're horrible people. You know, this is after they've gotten in, they're talking to God. And we did it all because we suffered so that we could come here and, you know, have our reward in heaven. We were good people, did good things. And then this rich person comes in, and even here, they get all these privileges. And God said, my son, <laughs> I just, my, my son, people like you come come to me in the in the millions. But a rich man like this is you know, a rare occurrence, somebody who can be wealthy and powerful and still make it into heaven. So we celebrate such uh, achievements. They're that saying something like, it's easier to get a camel through the eye of a needle than a rich person into heaven or something like that. Because, you know, being rich is a deficit, a diff- you know, a, a you know, liability in your spiritual life. And so why is this important to us in the truth community and, and everything else? is our system is doomed because our whole system is predicated on wealth and fame. And this comes from the pursuit of happiness. And it's been warped into people that the pursuit of happiness is to become wealthy and famous. And one of the great things about the American system is that you can come from poverty, someone like Jalen Brown, who came from poverty, talks about this in this interview, and rise up to the highest levels of uh, economic achievement. There are people who were born into poverty, immigrants who came here with nothing, who are now billionaires, and many more who are multimillionaires, right? And that's a great, you know, that's a great part of the material system, but it's become the reason why people think America's great. And people have freedom, the so-called freedom that we have here. Again, freedom is really lifestyle. When they say that people want to take away your freedoms, like George Bush, saying that these people, these angry people in other countries want to take away Americans' freedoms. What he means is your lifestyle. They want to take away your wealth, America's wealth. That's why these wars are fought, because they're living in poverty and they want to you know, have um, equal distribution of wealth or just have you know, not their resources and all their, you know, uh, the brain drain, all the best of the best come to America to make money. Why they suffer because they're, their resources are being exported here, and they have, you know, barely enough to get by. And they're kind of pissed about it, and Americans think it's our God-given right because we're all born with this American entitlement and all the rest of it, right? And so this is an important fact, that our system at its best, at its, you know, pinnacle of achievement, the, you know, what is considered to be a, a, a successful person in the capitalist system, does not deliver a better person, right? Every system should help you be the best version of yourself, especially spiritually. I mean, really, all of it's about being connected to God and moving forward spiritually. That's your soul's purpose for you here on this planet. Your soul has a singular purpose, and that's to return to the source. And if you think about it, that's all there could be, right? Your soul cares about one thing, and and that is to return back to God. And, you know, that makes total sense that that's what, what a soul would do, right? That's what a soul wants. And so on a material level, your soul doesn't care about your success or your... I mean, these are all, you know, burdensome things, that you, baggage that prevents your soul from getting back to the source, right? And so the system is a failure that way. And it makes you into a worse person, develops addictions and entitlements and bad habits and all these other host of things. And the documentation is all around you. We see it in every possible aspect and avenue of your existence. You see this, especially if you're older. And, you know, when I had, I was a kid, I had a black and white TV. You had to get up and turn the dial. And now you think about the TVs that we have. And then the Internet, which was completely unexpected for most of us. And the technological improvements how and the ease of life, a cell phone and, you know, all the rest of these things, right? I made a joke the other day. My wife was, um, we were 
you know, brought up that old English saying, I don't know why it came from, you know, but um, testicles, spectacles, wallet, and watch, right? <laughs> There's some, like these English guys. And she said that was before cell phones. And I said, yeah, the cell phone replaced the testicles, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> this is the aspect of, of modern life where things have supposedly gotten easier, but we spend so much time on technology and fixing it and, you know, all the things that to do with it, wasting time on it, that it's, you know, we're really slaves to it. And we're weaker. You see, each generation is worse. Each generation is weaker. America is a failure for that reason. Because the American system, which provides a wonderful lifestyle, which provides lots of free time, and that's the biggest thing. And most people don't have any free time. Most people, you know, most systems, they don't have any leisure time. They spend all their time just surviving. And most animals have spent most of their time just surviving. They have very little time for play. And they have much more simple lives, right? And it's like, you know, dogs sleep. I mean, they sleep a lot and, you know, all these things. My dogs are right now next to me sleeping on my bed. Like, <laughs> they just sleep like 18 hours a day, right? Um, I guess that's the, the leisure of not having belongings and some nut to meet, right? Just, you know, have to go and get your next meal. But in terms of people, they spend so much time just surviving. Homesteaders, you know, people in villages. And, you know, maybe they had more free time. I don't know. And at least they enjoyed their time together doing, uh, you know, working together. But in terms of this system, we see that rich people have more leisure time. At least, you know, uh, on paper, in, in theory. And Americans in general have more leisure time than other people around the world. And we use this leisure time to invest in uh, bad stuff, right? Bad habits, uh, drug use, uh, you know, just watching crap that uh, pollutes our spiritual condition on the TV and all these things. Whatever it is, very few people use that free time to do something good, to do something to make the world a better place, to do something to, you know, uplift uh, yourself and humanity. And most of all, connect to God and, and these other things, right? And so that is, you know, our, our biggest, uh, you know, our biggest asset is our, our free time where we could devote it to spiritual pursuit and nurture our soul, give our soul what our soul wants and still live materially good lives. But very few people do that. And with each succeeding generation, we see a de-evolution, the idiocracy aspect of our system. We're getting stupider, we're getting worse, we're getting, you know, more entitled, weaker. And look at the psychological depravity that is happening now in our system. And so it's a failure. And it's because a wealth-based system with the idea of the pursuit of material happiness is always going to fail. You have to base your number one priority as connecting to God. And then have, then you can have a good life. You know, aside from that, like, you know, yeah, you also can have a good material life. But if you don't have the first thing, then the second thing is hollow. The second thing makes you a, a, to, turns you into a, a bad person, a selfish person, and you know, a lost person, right? You look around at, at most Americans, and they're just lost. And that's, you know, that speaks to people in the truth community. And so you take something like you know, this controversy we've had lately with the, um, with the sound of freedom. And you can say abuse is some way, somewhat woven into human nature. But there was less of it in tribal situations. There was always deviant people, but much less. And, you know, the idea of human trafficking, you know, there's always been some elements of slavery, you know, in terms of conquered people. And even in, you know. But when you build big, giant civilizations with big, giant armies and big, giant cities and, you know, wealthy people and kings and, you know, all these you know, layers of hierarchy, it always ends up being very abusive. And all roads lead to the exploitation of children. And the wealth that we have here, the lifestyle we have here, the wars, the atrocities, regime changes, all these things, uh, economic sanctions, destroy countries' wealth and power and, uh, you know, their infrastructure. It always leads to depravity and human trafficking, things like this. Every war-torn country, every group of people that loses a war 
human trafficking becomes a part of it. There's that movie, The Whistleblower, where they're in Kosovo, and it's a war-torn country, and the UN and these various, uh, you know, these uh, these companies, these really wealthy companies that rebuild countries and, you know, get involved with the UN and post-war, uh, you know, the financial boom of, uh, you know, relieving the country of, the, stealing the countries, looting the country of their resources, always ends up with lots of human trafficking. You take down a government, human trafficking becomes way worse. As bad as governments are, human, without any sort of rule of law and, and gang rule, it becomes a place of human trafficking. It becomes, a, you know, a resource when, when the society is broken down. And so these truths uh, were never addressed and won't be addressed by the Cubies. And I want to get to a, a QB comment because it's just great here. The right-wing aspect of the truth community and the truth community in general, because none of us want to give up our, our whatever privileges we have, like this idea of white privilege, you know, American privilege or you know, male privilege or all these things. Nobody gives up their privileges. Very few people do, right? Master Chargy, the third master of the Sajmark system, uh, you know, the meditation that I do, he um, asked everybody to give up their caste names. Their last names represent the caste they're in. And 11 people did it. 10 of them were untouchables, which is the bottom level, right? And even, you know, even there was other untouchables that didn't want to get rid of their caste name. And only one person who was in a, a higher caste, uh, you know, agreed to do this. Because people just don't give up their privileges, no matter how, who's asking, right? People want their, you know, whatever it is. So there's a few comments here. This isn't just about, obviously, the sound of freedom. I'm just, you know, weaving that in there because of the importance of... Um, I'm just saying this because people want change, but they want other people to change. They don't want to give up anything themselves. And so this person says, enough already <laughs> to me. You are insulting and self-indulgent. And then you tie, then you tie a bow with be grateful. I'm not tying a bow. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't jive. This doesn't jive. You being insulting and self-indulgent and saying you're grateful, it doesn't jive. <laughs> if nothing else, the sound of freedom brings awareness to the consciousness of people that typically live on a pink cloud and eat bonbons. Have you listened to yourself lately? Step out and take a pause. Um, it's not. It's it's for cubies. It's for people who already are into this kind of thing, right? And that's self-indulgent. It's a group of people who want to be upset at the so-called elite and put all the problems on the you know these people with privilege and not change themselves. And that's you know the truth community in general. That if you don't want to give anything up, then you should shut your mouth. If you're not going to give up you know, anything or everything for change, then, you know, stop talking about like you're part of the solution because you're not, right? The other piece is to connect to God, which I, you know, this is the be grateful part. If you at least work towards connecting with God and becoming a spiritual person that brings God into your decision-making process, then that's, you know, that's the other thing you can do. You can materially give up your, you know, time and energy and try to make the world a better place. I don't believe in that because I don't think it can happen and the system can't be saved. But at least you're doing something, right? That you, you see that the world needs changing. And all the people who watch Sound of Freedom or Upset see that there's a problem. But there's actually, you know, at the root of the problem is the economic system and this idea of pursuit of happiness through material wealth and, and fame and power and these things. So the, you know, the human trafficking is just a, a part of the problem, a symptom you know, uh, an outcome. And so you have to change the system itself. And you guys don't want to do that. You don't want to give up your privileges. You don't want to give up, you, know, you don't want to change yourself. And so, you know, just saying that you're raising awareness of human trafficking and that movie does, and that's going to have an effect, it doesn't. It's not going to do anything. We already know it. The QBs had zero success at doing anything to stop human trafficking. It's self-indulgent. It's something that you guys are doing just to feel good about yourselves, you wallow in it, right? And you get all upset, and you come together, and you, 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 you lament, and you, you, you uh, criticize the the elite, and, and you know the people that are blocking it, and the the leftists and the liberals who are, you know, the 
part of the problem, but you're the you're the guys with the solution. You're the good guys, even though you know you're on the good team and Trump's a part of it. Like anybody who believes Trump's a good person, the evidence is overwhelming. He's a selfish prick. He's a narcissist. He's one of the worst, and he's an example of somebody with wealth and money and what it does to you. Hey, Mr. Trump. Hey, Mr. Trump. We look at Mr. Trump, right? That you know that's how he was treated. Like he'd walk into a room. Oh, look at him. It's Donald. He's a billionaire. He's famous. Oh, he's you know. He was wealthy and famous. He was a celebrity, and he was a, a so-called billionaire. And look at how selfish and entitled, and he's taking your donation money <laughs> and using it for his, uh, his you know, criminal cases and things like this, his defense. And he's just a, you know, a bad person and, you know, made worse by his success. And he rubbed elbows with Jeffrey Epstein, was good friends with him was seen with Jeffrey Epstein on multiple occasions, talked about Jeffrey Epstein, talked about how Jeffrey Epstein liked the young girls and said all these things, gave money to the Clintons, hung out with all these people. You know, they're all part of a club. And he conned you guys, all you guys, into thinking he was your savior. And you guys are still going back again, right? And so, you know, never addressing the key part that the system is doomed for failure because it's making people worse, right? The definition of a good system is a system that helps people become better, become, you know, uh, to have a deeper connection with God, to support their family. You know, to, uh, the system supports the family. It doesn't tear families apart, right? Brings families together, creates community, creates harmony, creates, you know, more love and positive feelings and not jealousy and hatred and negative feelings that our system is... Uh, you know, feeds off of, right? I'm just being honest about it. That's the difference here. You're living in some kind of delusion. And somebody who sits there and eats bonds, bonds, what was the thing? Let me find the comment again. Uh, it brings the uh, people, the typical, that typically live on pink cloud and eat bonbons. Those people don't want to watch the movie. Why would they watch this movie? And if they do, they'll just be another person, not, you know, someone sitting on the couch and that has low levels of consciousness, how is that person going to help you? Like, you know, if you can't do anything to change it, what do you think that there are better people out there that are sheeple, that don't have, that they have their heads in their sand when they wake up, they're going to, they're going to figure it out. If you can't figure out how to change this and you, you collective group of people who are upset about this, who are so-called critical thinkers, who are, you know, so much better than the average sheeple, if you, you know, that's the way you view yourself. If you can't figure out a solution, you think waking up the sheeple, they're going to be able to figure it out, right? They're sheeple, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> they don't solve problems. They, they just follow a, a, you know, a Judas goat into slaughter. That's what sheeple do. But this was the premier comment here. Uh, this person said, um, Q, was, Q was way ahead of the narrative still coming out. Not one QB has taken the boop. This is the best part. The person calls himself a QB, right? <laughs> Identifies the group as a QB. This is a name that I made up, you know, to talk about that you're a newbie, right? And it's a less, um, you know, it's a, it's a less insulting term than the Q boop, right, that people use. That you're a newbie, that you're just coming into this, that you don't, you know, you're not mature enough or developed enough. You're a newbie, a you know, new soul, a little experience, and you're just coming into the truth community, and you act like you're great and you're you're above it all when you're you know you're not like you haven't gone through any real uh, transformational process yourself, right? You're a newbie, and you're even worse, you're a QB, and it's not a term that you should be a you know. <laughs> Q was way ahead of the narrative, still coming out. Not when QB has taken the boop, you land somewhere between being based and following the herd you got you got get worked by the media uh, that's because i was talking about that that trump got worked by the system now nobody who listens to me would think i'm getting worked by the media and nobody who's conscious would say that q is way ahead of the narrative you have to believe in like you know fairy tales and unicorns and I mean, unicorns have a better chance of being real. There is a better ch chance of a horn growing on a horse <laughs> than there is of Q not being uh, controlled by the uh, intelligence community. You got worked by the intelligence community. 
they activated you as a you know destruction a destructive force in the truth community and that's just you know i mean that's facts right but this is the most q comment ever because it you know doesn't acknowledge the truth of it and then the person writes at the end you're in denial and in, in another comment like they 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 weren't satisfied with the <laughs> the first comment they said you're in denial this is from my video yesterday Mitch gets glitchy and Sinead, Bronnie James update and Chet returns, Chet Hanks. But this is the most, you know, this is one of the biggest Q comments because it says, Q was way, was way ahead of the narrative still coming out. Q was never ahead. Q was, whatever stuff that was real was because it was stuff the intelligence community knew was going to happen because they were doing it, right? <laughs> Anything that, Q lured you in with with being right was you know Q is the intelligence community it's probably the NSA maybe the CIA or you know combination of both right that are you that are working this operation I'm sure the FBI is also you know everybody's working the whole Q narrative because they want you to you know do what you're doing and that is tax stupid right but whatever Q got right and was very little was things that they knew were going to happen because they were doing it, right? They were creating these things. Then the second line, the this is probably the, the biggest line. Not one QB has taken the boop. You know, the boop that Trump put out with uh, Operation Warp Speed? Not one QB has taken it. So you're not listening to your leader? Because the QBs believe that Trump's here to, to save you. And Trump has, I mean, well, I'll play the... Um, I'll play the, you know, the the Trump compilation, but he was the guy that he was called. He called himself the father of the boop. And so he was a guy that was supposed to save you from the deep state. That's a centerpiece of the narrative, right? The storm is coming. You got worked by Trump, who's a narcissist and a selfish prick. And then you didn't take his, his, his signature accomplishment of COVID. Like he talks about this being his big accomplishment. So how do you, you don't even believe in the Q narrative. You, you, you know, if, so if not one QB took the boop, which I'm sure they did, that person's you know, delusional. But if they didn't take it, then you don't believe in your own narrative because Trump was the savior, right? And I think RFK was in that as, there as well as part of the narrative or JFK Jr. was still alive or something. But they were all, you know. And so if you didn't take the boop and you think that... um. You know, Trump was, what, was he lying or being deceptive? Or what do you think was happening there? That he pushed out, oper without Trump, there would be no blue, boop. <laughs> Trump was, you know, the, the father of it. And so either Trump was, either Q was right and Trump is is the savior and you're not taking your savior, savior's nectar that he's giving to you, his elixir, his, you know, his uh, salvation, his Kool-Aid, right? You're not taking it. So you're a fraud. You don't even believe in Q. You don't believe in Trump. You don't believe in Q. You know? <laughs> like, what is it? You either believe in it or you don't. You believe in him or you don't. You land somewhere between being based and following the herd. That's It's because you can't understand what I'm saying because you're not smart enough, right? Which is sad because this isn't rocket science. You know, but to think that that's the case, this is what QBs always do. They're in delusion. He says that Q is way ahead of the herd, and he's not. You're being worked by intelligence community. And then he says, we didn't take the boop. Well, then you're not believing in your own philosophy or your own dogma, which is that Trump is the savior. And so you're a fraud, and the rest of the QBs are frauds. And then, hey, you're, you're, you're a mainstream media person. You're a shill. That's the, you know, that's how they, because you're making me feel stupid. You know, so... <laughs> I have one, I only have, only have one option here, right? <laughs> Which is to to put something on you that's not true. You got gotten worked by the media. So this is just a classic QB comment. And then say to say that I'm in denial with a follow-up comment. Like everything the person's saying is that they're a fraud, that they're dope, that they keep on, you know, getting worked by something that, like the Q movement should have collapsed after Trump presidency. I mean, it should have, never been in existence because it was stupid. But when Trump uh, lost the election 
and the, all the way that went down, he turned on his supporters, all that stuff. It should have been the end of it. That should have been it. That should have been the end of the Q movement. So, you know, the, the point here wasn't to just disparage QBs and the Q movement, because it's all of us. It's a societal thing. It's what we are as Americans, right? We're consuming 20% of the world's resources or whatever it is. We have a, a level of uh, lifestyle and privilege. It'd be great if we were great people, right? If we were, you know, we're somehow making the world a better place and we were doing something with what we had. But we're just self-indulgent and entitled and it just gets worse with every generation. Some of it might be human nature, the flaws of being a human being, these things. But it's the system that is the, you know, the major culprit here. Because human beings have done better with other systems. With tribal systems, with village-based systems, with systems based in God and family. They have been better human beings, right? There's been times in human history where people are just a lot better. So we have the system we're 100% dependent on, and it's taking us in the wrong direction. And that is the ultimate in the truth community, right? The ultimate truth about this systemic failure. Because what you're looking at is a failed system. And you might be looking at a symptom of the failed system. And the QBs are great at that, but we all do it. You know, whether you're a truther, whether you're a sheeple, whether you're, you know, whatever you are, a Democrat or Republican, you find a villain, you find someone to blame, Find someone's some group of people that's the cause for the problem that's, you know, racist or whatever it is, you know, prejudiced. And you say, it's this group of pers- people, it's this person, it's this demographic, it's our enemies, it's the people that, you know, we're against. And if they would just change, the system would be better and everything would be great. That's, you know, that's the divide and conquer me- methodology of the system, right? I just was eating breakfast and I saw this thing about LeBron James's son and how, you know, he was basically dead, the, you know, info was coming out, and people who were there who were trained medical professionals were able to revive him, and they were praised, but they won't admit that there's a, an issue here, right? And, you know, right before that, on the other ch- news channel, they were talking about the election deniers, but we now know that the Hunter Biden laptop was, you know, known about by the FBI and the media for 11 months before the election, and they covered it up. And they don't want to admit that that affected the outcome of the election, which we all know it did, right? And so they're still going along with their lies, is what I'm saying. Young men are dropping, young athletic men and women are dropping dead from cardiac arrest and blood clots and things like this all around us. And all this information is coming out about the way that the media and the um, Democratic Party and even the Republican Party to some extent conspired to withhold information which would have changed the outcome of the election. But also the Biden administration was censoring people like RFK Jr. three days into his administration, telling him to deplatform him social media, threatening social media. RFK said that social media has this protection, this law, this this um, you know, some kind of, you know, whatever it is, article that they're not liable for what's said on their site. The site itself can't be sued. And so Biden administration has been threatening to take that away from these sites. And Mark Zuckerberg said that we would be done if um, that law was taken away, right? So they're protected by the government. So that's the leverage the government has over them. And Biden was, his administration was willing to use that to force them to censor us all and all the other things that are happening, right? And the news media, I turned it on, they're just denying you know, the results, right? You say something's true. You say something's going to benefit the health of people and it actually is killing people and you're not going to admit it because you're not. You're never going to admit it. You're just going to cover it up and censor people who, you know, who expose it or whatever. That's what they do. And the other piece was the, you know, stuff to do with, I mean, the whole censorship hearing was based in what RFK Jr. was saying and them censoring him and censoring the rest of us And when um, it was about Hunter Biden laptop and that being censored, that story, and they all turned out to be true and they're still not going to admit it, right? Just like the QBs won't admit that they got worked by the intelligence community and, you know, they were an intelligence community asset when they thought that they were actually making the world a better place, right? This is what I'm talking about. Like, you know, the hard truth of our situation is that we're dependent on and 
to some extent like our current system that gives us material privileges and it's a bad system it's taken us in the wrong direction and without it we would be in desperate straits we'd be in a post-apocalyptic situation where we'd have very little resources and a bunch of selfish entitled low-skilled people very weak people trying to survive and i mean we all know how that would go and so that's our predicament and you know most people don't want to you know, look at that because it's too painful and scary to think about. Anyways, let's go to Fran Drescher. <laughs> so before we get to Fran Drescher and then um, RFK, there's some UFO hearings going on. My son's been watching it. He told me it was kind of great. Um, I just don't have the time I'm doing like a big project outside. And um, I just don't have the time to like watch it. But I think it's sliding under the cracks. YouTube recommended this to me a couple days ago. I believe we have crashed craft, uh, stated earlier. Do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries. Yeah. Um, were they, I guess, human or non-human biologics? Non-human, and that was the assessment of people uh, with direct knowledge on the program I talked to that are... So they're saying they were non-human aliens discovered here this guy's testified i don't know who he is currently still on the program and was this documentary evidence this video photos eyewitness like how would that be determined the specific documentation i would have to talk to you in a skiff about so um so there's stuff like that going on where they're saying they found non-human pilots of ufos and other people say Project Blue Beam, it's some fake thing or whatever, I don't know. I personally believe that there is life outside of Earth and all the rest of it. So, um, <laughs> you know, do with it what you will. And then last night I started watching this thing called Slam Ball. And it's like the greatest sport ever. Coming. Let me just turn the thing off. So look at this guy. Kaboom! <laughs> I mean, that's these. Are, they have the most savage dunks. Look at the dude come off the trampoline and look at how high he is. Like, look at this. He's cocking back. They got these defenders who are huge and they just have these savage dunks. Um, they have hits like that. See, there's like hits like hockey. They can check them. These helmets are like worthless. The helmets are popping off. But look at this guy. He's getting checked here into the boards. They have like hockey checking. And then they have this. Like, this guy's like a huge dude. They have guys who are like football players. He gets checked there. He still comes in and does a, a windmill dunk there. Um, this guy comes in. Oh, that was just a, that sucked. <laughs> but there's a team called the Mob. I think there's just a team in the red here. And they were undefeated. This guy's a huge blocker. He comes in and he's a savage dunk from the, you know, whatever it is. But they can check like hockey, like I said. Um, out in this area, this out here is a four-point play beyond the uh, behind the trampolines here, behind this line. And then all dunks are three points. And it's physical, like, uh, you know, hockey and football, but also um, the trampoline part. It's like the best sport. I You know, I just watched the end of the – I watched some, some of it last night, and then I watched a game a little while ago. And they have some, like, complex offenses, a lot of alley-oop stuff. And they have, um, when they get fouled, show this part here. When they get fouled, it's like a, you know, one of these things where they do in hockey where there's the goalie and uh, an offensive player. And so the guy who gets fouled, the first foul of uh, each quarter, so there's like four of these or eight of these for the whole game. And what happens is the guy, um, the guy runs from, uh, let's see if we get a, he runs from back here, he dribbles up, runs from back there. He bounces off the trampoline, and then they have these huge guys who play defense who are um, like not only tall but physically big who try to time it and bounce off the trampoline, and they're incredible um, collisions at the rim. Like It's like sick stuff. And the rest of the quarter after the first, uh, the first foul for either team, they do that. They do this um, face-off kind of thing. And then after that, they just give the team points. There's no foul shots. There's no timeout. They don't have to take the ball out of bounds. They just, wherever they pick up the ball, they just start running. And so there's no, like, if the other team scores, wherever the ball is, you just start bringing it up the court. You can bounce on a trampoline. You have to dribble over here. 
and it's just like all action, you know, like hits and dunks and um, like blocks and stuff like that. And it's just like there's there's a face off right there. So that was a face off. So this guy's coming down. Let's just show you here. That was the dunk there. And these guys are getting way above the rim, right? So this guy's going to come way up here and then. But here's a face off. So this guy came from up here. This guy's on defense. He's timed it right. This guy's coming in and he just sends him back. I mean, it's like the best sport. I don't know why this is more popular. <laughs> it's like, it's like, uh, there it goes again. Oh, look at the check right there, right? Just laid the guy out. Like, there's stuff like that for no reason. I don't even understand the checking part. Like, there's like, <laughs> I mean, he's just like, you know, <laughs> there's like savage hits and, you know, crazy dunk attempts or crazy blocks, like almost on every play. Um, and, you know, this is um, the sport of the future. It's like rollerball even better. Like the trampoline part is the brilliant part because they're, uh, here's a, here's a look at it. Boom. I mean, just savage. I highly recommend slam ball. This is a very big deal. It is, Fran. It's the biggest deal of all. And it weighed heavy on us. But at some point, you have to say no. Exactly. Say no, Fran. So they got Fran Drescher, who has the unique distinction of probably the heaviest New York accent a woman could have. And she couples that with one of the most annoying voices. <laughs> And now she's just old, right? It hasn't worked in years. And we're not going to take this anymore. What are we I mean, don't take it, Fran. You should not be taking this. What are you doing? Moving around furniture on the Titanic? Yeah, that's crazy. Why would anybody do that? The ship is sinking. It's crazy. It is crazy. So the jig is up. Yes, it is, Fran. PTP. We stand tall. You have to wake up and smell the coffee. You just strung together all the cliches that she knows, right? <laughs> we are labor and we stand tall. That was the president. Of That's Fran Drescher. And so um, probably not your best spokesperson. Okay. okay, so RFK Jr. leads all their candidates a new Harvard-Harris poll. And so this is significant. He has got a 47% approval rating and only a 26% disapproval rating. Like Donald Trump has a high approval rating, almost as good as RFK. But his unfavorable is 49%. It's hard to get elected when you're hovering around 50% of disapproval. And, you know, and I think that's going to grow more for Trump. Elon Musk, for they put him in for whatever reason. Joe Biden has a uh, 39% approval. So he has, you know, 40% of Democrats who just won't, I mean, wake up and smell the coffee. <laughs> and he has um, a 53% disapproval. So the gap number, which is a key number here, is 21 for Kennedy. Elon Musk is second and Ron DeSantis is third. And so, um, you know, these are people who, and again, this isn't uh, even Bernie Sanders is, Sanders is beating Joe Biden. This isn't, you know, people who necessarily going to vote for any of these people. Right. This is just, you know, everybody like they might have their favorite candidate. But in terms of, um, you know, Kennedy, when you hear him speak, he is, you know, just genuine. And that's that's the key to his success, because where other politicians are, you know, they have poll data and they have. Um, they have talking points and things. And Kennedy just answers uh, what I think is as honestly as he possibly can. That's his big appeal. That's what makes him a, a different candidate. He just tells you, you know, what he thinks about something. He doesn't think about whether it's going to be more popular or not more popular or whatever. He said, this is my position and this is why it's my position. And it's refreshing, right? It's a lot. It's uh, something we haven't seen. I haven't seen in my lifetime. RFK Jr. is winning. A new Economist poll shows that Kennedy is more popular and far less hated than either major party frontrunner. And that was from a while ago, and this is this is a, an older poll. And so, um, you know, this is big news for Kennedy. And we'll see what happens. Jojo Magoo is just imploding. 
I don't know how long they'll even try to roll him out there. Just the way he walks. Like, it's amazing that 40% of Democrats, or 40% of the, you know, people that's, you know, lots of Democrats, right? <laughs> you know, 40% of the population. I mean, even with Trump. How can 40% think Trump is good after all that he's done? And 40%, I mean, Jojo Magoo, even worse, right? So um, Dana Bash from CNN. Some of this and break it down for you. Misrepresentations. I, like, I didn't say those things. So you just heard it. Defamation, distortions, misrepresentations, reading between the lines, a citing motive, guilt by association. That is how RFK Jr. offers an answer for every accusation. But believing him that he's just a contrarian, that he never spread hate, requires ignoring his own words. COVID-19, there's an argument that it is ethnically targeted. There's an argument. That means that you could make the case for. He didn't say he had the scientific data to prove that it was ethnically targeted. He said that there are countries that are making biological weapons that are ethnically targeted, U.S. and China amongst them. And so I believe that's true. Okay, but he may or may not have the proof. Maybe he just knows that. I don't know. And so then he said this. COVID-19 is targeted to attack uh, Caucasians and, uh, and, uh, and uh, black people. The people who are most immune are Ashkenazi Jews and, uh, and Chinese. That kind of denial and deflection showing up over and over in this hearing. So they introduced into the, the record there, the Republicans did, the um, studies that back up with RFK Jr. saying in terms of the demographic breakdown of who, who was doing worse with COVID based in genetics. And so that's not spreading hate. <laughs> you know, I mean, we all know it. And so like just they, whenever they get involved, they just come in, they suck, and they don't care how bad they suck or how bad they look. I've been covering MSNBC, so let's get a CNN Right now on Capitol Hill, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is continuing to testify before a House committee there. It's a hearing about alleged government in censorship. It's not alleged because right off the bat, whoever that guy is, um, don't tell me, don't care, don't need to know. The guy who was head of the, the Republicans said in his opening statement, one or two minutes in, that RFK, the first thing that Joe Biden did three days into his presidency was to tell Twitter and other platforms to remove RFK's post, I guess Facebook was it, I don't know, about uh, Hank Aaron. And they were telling him to deplatform. And they sent, sent in all this evidence. Plus, there's a court real, ruling where a judge in uh, Louisiana and the Biden administration offered no defense and didn't, didn't uh, deny any of the charges. And it was uh, 150 pages of documentation of them threatening and bullying social media to censor people and things that were harmful to their party and whatever it was, right? So it's a fact. And, of course, the Hunter Biden laptop that was, we all know about that, and the Twitter files. It's established, but, of course, they're not going to say this here because CNN is getting crushed by social media. There's no future for CNN. And so they're not going to say, yeah, it's a slam dunk because they're pressuring the social media giants as well because they're losing. They can't compete. And so, you know, this is just a, a bald face lie by this dude right here. Yep. Democrats have actually urged House Republican leaders to disinvite him to uh, this hearing over his documented history pushing dangerous conspiracy theories. Dangerous conspiracy theories. Because he does that and they have to, you can't hear those conspiracy theories. You hear them. It's like, you know, the end of the first Indiana Jones, the, the Raiders of the Lost Ark. When they, when they brought the Lost Ark out and opened it up and everybody who uh, you know, had their eyes open was, uh, was eviscerated you know, by the truth of these conspiracy theories or the, the lies of these conspiracy theories. Just this week, he was rebuked by his own family for pushing an unfounded conspiracy theory that COVID... You mean a couple of members in his family? ...was actually targeted to hit certain ethnic groups while sparing Jewish and Chinese people. In his opening remarks this morning, he insisted he's never been racist, anti-Semitic, or anti-vaccine. I've never been anti-vaccine. 
But everybody in this room probably believes that I have been, because that's the prevailing narrative. CNN's Daniel Dale has been watching this hearing for us and checking the facts on it. Daniel, He's been checking the facts. This guy's checking the facts. Now, what are the facts here? So Mr. Kennedy says he's not anti-vaccine because he just wants safe vaccines, to which anyone who has followed his public remarks should respond, come on, Kennedy has spent... Come on, come on. Okay, CNN, look at this. <laughs> Ellie and m and F are here. And here's Jake. So RFK... Uh, uh, was told a story about how Tapper was going to run a news piece they worked on for like weeks about Kennedy's documentary. And ABC News came out and said that they were pressured by the drug companies and they were pulling that piece. And Tapper said to him he'd never seen censorship like that before. That was years ago when he was working at ABC, but he's a complete shell now and now he just comes out with a little whiny voice and his somber tie and you know, just lies and misres misrepresents the truth. Al Tapper is, you know, he's um, on CNN and he's gone full somber tie shill. I want to uh, turn to something on the Democratic side that emerged this weekend. There is growing angst that uh, potential third party challengers, uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. and Marion Williamson, could really hurt uh, President Biden's reelection chances. Um, you know what else could hurt him? Like he's dead. <laughs> You know what else could hurt him? He's a, he's a walking corpse. That could also hurt him. RFK Jr., uh, the New York Post reports, with video, it's not just their account, uh, spreading some really deranged lies about, the co about COVID. Uh, that deranged lies. Those are some deranged lies. Well, what's deranged about them? So we know that there are biological weapons. We know that they were using, they were doing gain of function in these labs. We know that if you were going to, if you had the ability to um, make it ethnically targeted and you were a country, right, like a, you're going to war with some country and you're going to release a biological weapon that's ultimately going to come back to you, you would have it kill more of the enemy. I mean, this is just makes sense. And it's not like, oh, that's some evil conspiracy theory. That's stuff that is completely believable. The other part is that there was uh, a pretty large disparity between certain ethnic groups and, and die and the people who died versus other ethnic groups. And so there's nothing deranged about it, right? It might not be true, but at least there's merit in this idea. And he said there's a case to be made, right? Uh, Kennedy did. He didn't say it was a slam dunk, an argument to be made. That, that really walk into anti-Semitism and anti-Asian bigotry. The New York Post has tape of Kennedy saying, quote, COVID-19 there's an argument that it is ethnically targeted. COVID-19 is targeted to attack Caucasians and black people. The people who are most immune are Ashkenazi Jews and Chinese. We don't know, know whether it's deliberately targeted that or not. We do know that the Chinese- He said right here. Chinese are spending hundreds of millions of dollars developing ethno, ethnic bioweapons, unquote. There is no truth to this. Uh, There's no truth? How much does Chinese, own, how does much does China own you? <laughs> you don't think China's doing that, right? You don't think that this was released as a biological weapon. I don't think the Chinese did this because it, it would be an act of war. I think it was a collaborative effort. I think the U.S. was involved in this and all the other, you know, drug companies and the rest of it. But I believe it's a bioweapon. And, you know, just come on, Tapper. Like, just unbelievably, uh, I mean, just lying, right? Just being a, a complete shell. Uh, there, you know, in, in, I... <laughs> Plenty of Ashkenazi Jews and plenty of Chinese and Asian people uh, died of COVID. Uh, now, I don't know about Ashkenazi Jews, but I there was one study I found that said Chinese people were far less likely to die, almost two to one. You had you know, for every two people that died who were were white, black, or Hispanic, and even more so for Native people, there was um, there'd be one person who was Asian. And so that was a legitimate study that was done. And there was other ones that were cited and maybe more detailed, right? And so that is whatever it is. Like, it doesn't matter whether people died. It's the, the rate in which they die, right? Kennedy didn't say that people who are Asian or Ashkenazi Jews didn't die. He said that they died in less frequency, right? He didn't make that sort of claim. And that is backed up by these studies, apparently. It's, it's a deranged argument. 
Um, but this it's guy, deranged. Look at her shake her head. It's so deranged. He is posing. He's polling in the double digits among Democrats. Well, but again, I think that is about more about name recognition. I mean, his own family doesn't support him. And as you just. You mean his whole family of like 500 people? 500 Kennedys are against what he's saying, right? <laughs> Anyways, why can't CNN be more like slam ball, right? <laughs> We see some of the CNN reporters out there playing slam ball. Um, just briefly, and I said this before, I think during the hearing, I think I said it, but, you know, this thing that he said was in an obscure interview that wasn't going to be publicized. I did, I've seen a lot of Kennedy stuff, and I never saw that interview. But the New York Post published it, a few other places published it. And they needed something to attack him with because they knew that Biden administration and mainstream media and the FBI were all guilty of First Amendment violations and censorship. And that was displayed in the hearing. So they needed something that they could do these sound bites with and slam Kennedy for. And they knew he wasn't, that he isn't uh, racist or anti-Semitic. They knew that, right? They're just making this up because they have to say something. But they're the ones who are publicizing it. They're the ones who are bringing this to everyone's attention, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't have even probably seen this. I know he said it something similar in another interview about how these biological weapons are being made by China and America, he said, you know, amongst other countries that are targeting certain uh, genetics prevalent in other races and things like this. So that's something he said. I don't know if he has the, the data to back it up or where he got that information, but I believe that's very plausible and probably likely just based on how people are and the, the way that they've, I mean, they've created weapons of war that like the neutron bomb that left the buildings, but killed the people. But these news people and these, you know, politicians say they don't want deranged and psychotic conspiracy theorists to have a platform. And yet they're always talking about the conspiracies. Whenever Trump says something that's like, they're, they want them deplatformed but they don't mind talking about what he said. They've given lots of airtime to the Cubies and talking about what Cubies said and believe, and they've done this with RFK. And so, you know, why do you need to deplatform people when you yourself are talking about the things that you say are deranged and, and scary and bad? Like, they're just, you know, they're just liars. <laughs> liar, liar, pants on fire. Only spirituality will save this world. It's Paramano, definitely pointing for the apocalypse and the ascension. Everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.